Jesus, he will lift you by his love out of the angry way. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will. He your savior wants to be. Be saved today. It was love. It was love lifted me when nothing else could help. It was love. It was love lifted me. It was love lifted me when nothing else could help. Lord lifted me. God is so good. God is so good. God is is so good is so good to me God is so good is so good God is so good is so God is so good. God is so good. So good to me. He answers prayer. Answers prayer. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. Answers prayer. He's so good to Let the church say amen again. Amen. Certainly a blessing being here this morning. Amen. God is good. Amen. And we need to say that more often. Amen. God is good. Amen. Just want to remind us once again from words of Solomon, chapter 4. Solomon reminds us, beginning with the fifth verse, get wisdom, get understanding. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. With this in mind, let us bow and let us uh, continue to do our very best in the Lord. I'm going to ask you to bow with me and pray along with me. Bow at this time, please. Father God, once again, we approach your throne of grace. We... Thank you, Father, for blessing us to be on this side of the ground. You raised us up this morning, Father, for a certain reason, a certain purpose. Only you know. So, Father, we're just grateful and we're thankful. And we pray, gracious Father, that we all have gathered here between these walls to worship thee in spirit and in truth. And Father God, we ask you to continue to bless us 
And before we go any further, we just ask you to forgive us, Father, for anything that we've said and done. We want to thank you, Father, for blessing us on yesterday, on the meeting that you, we prayed about and you brought it forth. We just thank you, Father, for the decisions and the things that was made. And we just thank you, Father, for our leaders. We ask you, Father, to continue to bless them and strengthen them because these men are your men. And gracious Father, we are a congregation. And we just pray, gracious Father, that we will not lean into our own understanding. In all our ways, we acknowledge you. Help us, Father, when we fall short of this. We just love you so. We thank you, gracious Father, for loving us. And Father, please forgive us because often we, we fail, we fall short, yes. and we just love you because we know you're there for us. Yes. And kind Father, we, in this community, we represent in you. And we just pray, gracious Father, we're doing our very best to uh, exemplify through our lives, our mannerism, the way we live, that people can see Christ Jesus, and they will want to be your children as well. And Father, we pray for those among us who have lost loved ones. We pray that you would strengthen them, strengthen the family. And we just pray, gracious Father, it would also draw all of them closer to thee. And gracious Father, for the sick, the shut-in, we say a special prayer as usual. Bless and keep them according to your will. And strengthen them, Father. And we pray, gracious Father, that you continue to bless Brother Paul as he stands before us. We pray that you would strengthen his body, strengthen his voice, give him the ability through the songs that he brings before us, your praise and Zion songs. Continue to help us, Father, in all our ways. Help each and every one of us. And kind Father, for those who are locked out in the world who does not know Christ out of the pardon of their sin, we also pray for them. We pray, gracious Father, for those where seeds has been planted. And we just pray that it's being watered and you would give the increase somewhere in this world. But kind Father, we love you, we honor you, and we just pray you continue to bless us throughout this day and the rest of our lives. In Christ Jesus' name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. He keeps blessing me over and over. Over. Yes, he keeps blessing me over. 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 And he gets sweeter as the days. Oh, what a love between my Savior. He keeps blessing me over and over, oh, over, oh. Loving me, he keeps over, over, over. And he keeps loving me over. Over, over, ah, and he gets sweeter as the days go. Oh, what a love between my Savior and I. He keeps loving me over and over, over and over. Over again. Our song after our lesson this morning is 633, Prepare to Meet Thy God. But before we get to our preacher this morning, if you look in your bulletin, there's a sheet with the singer's ministry on the very top, and on the back of it, there's a song, and I've been working on this song, I guess about six months now, I'm William. We're still in worship now, so we're not going to be gossiping and, you know, we're still in worship. And we know God is paying attention. We're in the king's court now. 
And so we're going to make this presentation together by faith. It's an easy song to learn. I'm going to sing, and the, the tenors have the melody. Brother uh, Thomas, if you, if you would help me out with that. And I know you know harmony, so you can uh, pick it up real easy, but it's very simple. But as I was working on it and praying about it, I said, I know some people are going to be saying, we ought to learn some when we ain't in worship. But when we had practice, people wouldn't show up, so we do it in worship. So it's convenient, so, so, but we're not taking away from worship. God is still the one that the reason we are here. The song is called Sing Hallelujah. I got unknown as the author because I don't know who did it. Uh, William Moss introduced it to me. His sisters introduced it to him, and uh, they got it from a young man named Steve Adams, and he got it from a church in Valdosta, Georgia. So at this point, my sons are researching it, trying to find out who wrote it, but it's a great song. So those on this side, just look to William Moss if you can't keep up. Um, I told him I was going to call him out to, to be the leader over there. But it's easy. If you know harmony, you'll get it. Okay. Everybody on board. Okay, here we go. Oh, what joy. Oh, what joy when we get home. Rest beneath. Rest beneath that cloudless dome. In that land. In that land where saints Never die. We're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by and by. When we reach that city of the new Jerusalem, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by and by. How the ransom singers will join in to lift that hymn. We're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by him. Oh, what joy, what joy when we get. We're going to rest beneath, rest beneath cloudless dome. Oh, in that land, in that land. Where saints never die. Oh, we're going to sing. Hallelujah. By and by. Good, Tyson. In that mighty chorus. Voices will so sweetly blend. As we sing. Hallelujah. By and by. Gone will be our sadness. Pleasures there will never end. Oh, as we sing, hallelujah, by and by. Oh, what joy. We're going to rest beneath, rest beneath that cloudless dome. Oh, in that land, in that land, my saints never die. Oh, we're going to sing. Hallelujah, by and by, victory and love, and love will be our everlasting theme as we sing, hallelujah, by and by, praising our Redeemer, our Redeemer, there beside the crystal stream, we're going to sing, hallelujah, by and by, oh, what joy, what joy, when we get home, we're going to rest beneath, rest beneath cloudless dome, oh, in that land, in that land, where saints never die, oh, we're going to sing, hallelujah, by and by. and by. Oh, what joy, what joy when we get home. We're going to rest beneath, rest beneath that cloudless dome. Oh, in that land, in that land, saints never die. Oh, we're going to sing. Hallelujah. By and by, oh, what joy, what joy, when we get home, we're going to rest beneath, rest beneath that cloudless dome, oh, in that land, in that land, 
Saints never die. Oh, we're going to sing. Hallelujah. By and by. One of the things about Crenshaw is that you, you learn new songs real fast. And, and, and I like that. I like that. I've heard that song before, and I, I think it's a beautiful song. Uh, our ushers are trying their very best to make sure that everybody has a, a seat and is seated comfortably. Uh, well, I don't want you to be comfortable. I want you to be excited about it. Uh, but if there are some seats and they ask you to move over, we would appreciate it if you were to accommodate uh, those. I don't have any apologies, but our building is too small for the number of people who are members here. And, and the reason why I say I don't apologize is that uh, we would spend more money on providing a seat for you to sit down for an hour and a half than we would to help those who are needy and hungry and lost. And so let's get uncomfortable for a minute, and, and, and let's just hook up together. And Lord, y'all didn't get that one. Let's just get a little bit closer together uh, and, and allow somebody to sit uh, beside you. And the ushers are going to come, and they're going to ask you uh, to either move down front, move closer uh, to each other, and, uh, and, and make it a lot easier. In the book of Mark, chapter 8, in the book of Mark, chapter 8, I want to read a few verses, uh, beginning with verse number 22, with verse number 22 of Mark, chapter 8. Uh, and let me start reading, and I know that you're going to catch up if you haven't found it already. The Bible says they came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him, and he entreated him to touch him. And taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village. And after spitting in his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for I am seeing them like trees walking about. And then again he laid his hands upon his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him home, saying, do not even enter the village. I want to speak for a few minutes, and hopefully, uh, prayerfully, that I will be able to complete this message. If not, then we will do... Uh, uh, a second uh, part, uh, allow this to be part one. I want to speak on the subject of a second touch, a second touch. Sometimes uh, I fear that we are raising a generation of children who are unwilling to work for and wait for the important things in life. The reason why I feel that is because I see in my uh, generation and even in the one after me an unwillingness to wait as well. Perhaps we are a product of our culture in this regard. Maybe the technologies of Western culture that they certainly influence how we view life. And we have certainly made life at the end of the 21st century or the 20th century significantly different than any other time in history. Our technology has fostered up upon us what I call an instant age. Today we are able to have what we want instantly in short order. From instant coffee to instant on TVs to microwave ovens that cook in minutes, 
to a variety of other conveniences. We have come to expect not simply to have what we want, but to have it now. And to have to wait for things has become a burden to many of us. And it has become a burden to us, if it has to me, it will be intolerable to our children. Now this is unfortunate because generally the best things in life take time. Our relationships are like that. The reason why we have so many divorces is that you have an instant courtship. That's going to, that's going to, I see her, I see him, I want to marry you, I want to marry him, let's go to Las Vegas, get it done, and go to the lawyer a month later. In order to have a, a, a meaningful and a lasting relationship, we must spend time building that relationship. You cannot get to know somebody overnight. Amen. You must invest the time if you're going to reap the benefits and the, and the dividends. Other important things like education for our career and skill in craftsmanship also takes time to be done right. Faith can be just like that as well. Not all of us have instant faith. Sometimes faith must grow. But certainly it's worth nurturing and worth waiting for. God always deals with his people on the basis of faith. And that means that we do not always get what we need from God. And we don't get it from God instantly. Sometimes things come gradually as our faith grows. But I think that's okay. Because as we see in our text today, we have the blind man of Bethsaida received his sight through the repeated touch of the Savior's hand. What he got did not, he didn't get it instantly. But he did get it. It came, not all at one time, but it came uh, somewhat gradually. He needed not only, not merely a first touch, but, but he needed a second touch. And so do we. Sometimes we have to come together more than 52 times a year. Sometimes we're going to have to come together again and again and again. And the encouraging news is, is that, that God is a God of a second touch. And the incident of the blind man of Bethsaida is a wonderful story of how God deals differently with different people. It is a story of healing. But unlike many of Jesus' healings, this one did not occur instantly. There was a process that was involved in this healing. And this, this story communicates to us the needed truth that God deals with each one of us on the basis of what we need. And just as we are not all stamped out of the, out of the same mold, so God's miracles do not come in a cookie-cutter fashion. Just as we are not a machine, God does not deal with us with a method. He meets each and every one of us personally where we are. And he deals with every one of us as individuals. In verse number 22, there was some expectation, uh, expectations of the people. The Bible said in verse 22, they, they came uh, to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and entreated him to touch him. When Jesus, when Jesus came to Bethsaida, he was met by a group of people with a, a blind man in tow. 
And these people undoubtedly wanted to see the blind man healed. Mm -hmm. So they began, ask, they began to ask Jesus to touch him. And so what we see here are the expectations of people. As those expectations relate to God and to his work. And all of us have expectations in this regard. And it may uh, well benefit us to look at the expectations we have to see whether they are indeed accurate and to see whether they are reasonable. We have expectations of God that's unreasonable. God, if I can't have a Mercedes, I don't like you no more. You, you, you let me get old. I know some of you don't want to get old. I see how you paint yourself up. I'm talking about brothers. Did y'all know that men... I, I try a lot to pull it in and to make myself look like I'm, you know... Arnold Schwarzenegger ain't what he used to be. What were these, what were these people's expectations in reference to God? We can only uh, expectulate as to their views based on certain evidence in, in Scripture about, around and about this region. But say there was not uh, on our Lord's top list uh, of best cities in Israel. As a matter of fact, we have every indication from Scripture that it was an insensitive and that it was a hardened area. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 21, Jesus cries out and say, Woe unto you, Chorazin! Woe unto you, Bethsaida! For if miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. This was indeed a very strong rebuke from our Lord. And undoubtedly, great miracles had occurred in Bethsaida. But they only had hardened their heart. No repentance had occurred. They were spiritually insensitive. And perhaps this may account for Jesus' command to this blind man after he had healed him. In verse number 26, where he says, do not even enter the village. Somebody told me that when they uh, counsel people who have certain addictions, or they're in a neighborhood that is not conducive uh, to a healthy lifestyle, that when they finish therapy, they tell them, don't go back to where you used to be. Don't go back into that environment. Don't go back and live in that neighborhood. Don't hang out with the same crowd. If you're going to escape this, get away from that. And, and, and so this, this, this area, he told him, don't go back. Stay away from the village. So perhaps these people, uh, I don't know what the, what the reason was. Maybe they just wanted to put God on, on, on blast and, and say, you did that one, now do this one. Perhaps all they wanted to see was another miracle to tantalize their senses. We can only speculate on that. Perhaps all kinds uh, uh, of speculations that we have of God. Many of us see God as the divine Santa Claus who is there entirely for our benefit. To some, to some we have a right to expect from God anything we want, whether it's right or not. Some see God as a, as a, as a heavenly vending machine where you put your money in and you pull the right lever and you get what you want. This is why it is so important for us to study the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about God. We say, we say we worship God, but what kind of a God do we worship? One that we make up, one of our own devising, 
Or do we worship the God that is revealed in Scripture, the true God? God is not some impersonal force in our universe. In our universe, He is not merely a supreme being, just that, and hanging way out yonder. The Bible reveals God to us. And we're going to have to relate our relationship with the God as a person. God is someone who is intimately concerned to getting to know us and our getting to know him. And so in the section of the scripture that I hope I can get to later on, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And then he asked another question. He asked another question. He said, I want to know who do you say I am? And these are quick key questions that we're going to have to answer about God. Do we really believe God is? And how does God relate in your life? Do we know him personally? I, I, I'd like to say I do. Sometimes I know him better than other times. I, know him, I knew him well this morning. I talked to him on the way here. And especially when that person ran the red light and barely clipped me, I, I knew God. But when things went well and, and I was able, uh, when I was able to write out my, uh, yeah, it's here, my contribution check, I knew God. But when I'm broke and when you mess with me and lie on me and talk about me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, God, I don't. I want to step over here. But I want you to know that in all circumstances, no matter what, you're going to have to have a relationship with God that is going to stay with God, and your attitude is going to have to be a God attitude. How do we understand that he is the creator, that he is the Lord of this universe? How have we surrendered our lives in humble obedience to him? How do you view God? How you view God determines how you view yourself. We need to make sure that we are serving the God that is revealed in the Bible. And not some cementalized version of our own making. People have many expectations of God. They also have expectations in reference to God's work. We see this clearly in the people who brought this blind man to Jesus. And it says in verse number 22 that they entreated him to touch him. No doubt these men had seen Jesus heal other blind people. And generally he helped people with a touch. Jesus loved to touch people. And through his, ch- through his touch, he implanted his grace. The touch was something that people could see. So these people assume that the touch of Jesus was his method. They expected Jesus to touch him. And they expected Jesus to heal him. And here again, we're not altogether sure that these people's motivation and what it was, perhaps they only wanted to see a miracle. In any case, Jesus didn't fulfill their expectations in quite the same way that they'd asked him. Look at verse number 23. Uh, the Bible says, And taking the blind, blind man... By the hand, they brought him out of the village. And after spitting on his eyes, laying hands on him, they asked him, do you see anything? Look at verse 23. Do you, do you see anything? The first thing Jesus does is to take the blind man and, 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 and lead him out of the village. Why did he do this? Perhaps, perhaps we can only speculate. Perhaps there was a great crowd waiting to see Jesus put on another performance. 
Perhaps Jesus wanted to get the blind man all by himself. After all, it may not have been his idea to come to Jesus in the first place. Nothing is said about the blind man's desiring to be healed. We don't even know that he had any faith at all in Jesus. And perhaps Jesus needed to spend some personal time with this man. In any case, we have a picture of Jesus personally taking this man by the hand and, and leading him out of the village, taking him around obstacles in the path, telling him where to step and, and perhaps telling him where not to step. It's, it's a beautiful picture. It's a picture of the involvement of our Savior in a single human life. This should remind us that Jesus is willing to take the time with us as individuals. And, and he's willing to lead you as a blind person around the obstacles of life. He's basically saying, step this way. Watch out. Don't go that direction. If you go that way, you're going to fall off the cliff. Why don't you come in this direction? He took this blind man. In addition to leading the blind man down, Jesus did not just touch him. The scripture says that he spit. His eyes. And then he laid hands on him. God's methods cannot be reduced to just a formula. If that's the case, he would have gone around spitting in the mud and putting, putting it on the eyes of every blind person. If you notice, he didn't heal everybody that way. He, he healed this man. And, 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 the, and, the, and the lesson behind all of this, if I don't get to finish this, is that Jesus deals with you as you are, not as we are. Jesus comes into your life to deal with you, with your issues and your situations, and it's not up to me to decide how God ought to deal with you. Amen. Jesus obviously did not treat this blind man as he treated others. Blind Barnabas, for instance, was... He was treated in a different fashion. Why the change? Undoubtedly, the blind man needed uh, the method which Jesus used. It was a personal application for an individual situation. What we expect God to do is not always what he does. But we can be assured that what he does is precisely what we need to do. And what we need. Sometimes God has to knock some of us down in order for us to look up. Sometimes God has to take away your procession so you can appreciate the power of God. Amen. What are some of the symbols? I have a few minutes left. If y'all say amen, I have less than that. Y'all were being nice. You didn't say amen. I, I know you wanted to, but you, you were being nice to me. That's so nice. There are some symbols of grace. We seem to be afraid of grace because we're law-abiding people. The law says, the law says, the law says. The rules are, the rules are. But there are certain things that's called grace. And so we ask ourselves, what is the significance of the action of Jesus? Why does he take the man by his hand? Why does he spit in his eyes? Why does he touch him? These are all outward actions. Why does he treat others differently? I believe the answer lies in the fact that these are all symbols of grace. It's important for us to understand the symbols of grace are not the substance of grace. When these men brought the blind man to Jesus, they besought Jesus that he would touch the blind man. No doubt they had seen Jesus touch other blind men and with the result that the blind men saw. But the touch was not the grace. You know why? Because you can see the touch. They cannot see the grace. But it was his grace that was the substance.
substance of the miracle. The Bible says, by grace, we are saved through faith. That's the way it always works. Both faith and grace at work at the, in the touch of Jesus. But we must not confuse the touch for the grace. Symbols are not the substance. But symbols do serve to stimulate faith. After all, they are symbols of his grace. Jesus always, always dramatized his work based on the need at hand. And sometimes he would merely speak to people. And his word was good enough. Other times, he would lay his hands on people as well as speak to them. And the very act of laying his hands upon him would have served to stimulate their faith. And now we see him spitting on the eyes of this man, laying hands on him. No doubt this served to encourage this man's faith. Isn't it good? Isn't it good to have somebody who loves you to come up and give you a hug? Isn't it good when you've been... Uh, and I hate to say it this way, you've been in, in the devil's lion den all week. And then when you got paid for the work that you did, it was not enough. And then when you come to the house of God and there's somebody who doesn't have the same faith that come up and give you a hug and say, I love you no matter what. I guess I didn't get amen. Let's go back and, and then talk about the process. Notice here. The process of faith. Jesus took this blind man and, 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 and through in order to restore his sight. Look at verse 23 and 24 and 25. The Bible says, and taking the blind man by the hand. The Bible says he brought him out of the village and after spitting on his eyes, laying hands on him. He asked him, do you see anything? Mm -hmm. Look at what happened. He looked up and said, I see men, mm -hmm. but I, I see them as trees mm -hmm. walking about. I had some surgery, uh, and on my eye, I had a cataract. Mm -hmm. And it was before I had the surgery. And some of y'all know what I'm talking about. This left eye was horrible. I, if I cover up, y'all didn't look like I said they're people, but they don't look like people. Y'all people, but you don't look like people. You could preach that, can't you? There are some people who are looking at y'all, and you ain't people. Because... We are looking at eyes that are not clear. All right. yes, sir. Because who you are is not as important as who I am with God. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a devil, be one. Right. Just don't make me one. Yes. If you want to be evil, be evil. Yes. Just don't make me evil. Yes. If you want to be bad, be bad. But it's not going to make me bad. Because I want my eyes to be clear. Let me go back to what I wrote down. This focus, the focus here is upon faith. That is always the focus of what God does in our lives. God is interested in our faith. God is excited about our faith. God acts on the basis of our faith. Time and again, we, he, we hear, see Jesus saying, go thy way. What happened? Thy, my putting my hands on you. My spitting. That's not what he said. Go thy way because your faith made you whole. What Jesus uh, was after in this blind man was not faith. Was faith. God is more interested in developing faith in us than he is in our physical healing. Jesus was willing 
to heal this blind man, but he was more interested in developing faith in him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close in just a moment, and hopefully I could come back at another time. But there's some, indis, some indication that this blind man may not have had much faith. It does not seem to be, he does not seem to be an instigator in coming to Jesus. It seems from, from the account that he passively goes along with what Jesus is doing. And even after Jesus laid hands on him the first time and asked him, did he see? His response does not seem to be overly enthusiastic. Perhaps it is because his faith was growing as Jesus was ministered to him. And sometimes that is the way faith grows. And that's the way it comes. This should be very encouraging to us. There may be some who claim to have the ability to believe God for anything. But I know that that ain't the case always. That's not the case with all of us. Trusting Jesus more generally means getting to know him better. Some people who say that, Brother Curl, I, just to see you from a distance, I got one impression. Now that I know you better, I see the real you. Now, I ain't going to ask the question. I'm going to leave that hanging. Getting to know him better is something which takes time. When you come up out of the water, does not guarantee you know God completely. You're going to have to interact and react and study and hang out with God's people. And the devil is going to show up at the same time and put somebody who looks good, acts good, and talk good right beside you. And lean over and say, you know, that ain't it. That ain't God. That ain't This is precisely what this blind man needed. And I know from personal experience that I need it many times as well. In fact, in fact sometimes, sometimes I need a, a third touch. Sometimes, sometimes I need a, a fourth touch. And sometimes it gets so bad I need a fifth touch. And the truth be known. Sometimes after the thousand touch, yes, I still need another. Amen. But thank God. Amen. Thank God. He is willing. He is willing to give us what we need. If we need the second touch, then he is the God of the second touch. Amen. Do you need the touch? Are you standing, sitting, thinking that God is a God mm -hmm. of a second touch? And I know. And some of us need God more now than ever before. If you're broke, you need God. If you got married, you need God. Don't, don't put Eric down. He's getting married. I think that's a blessing. Lord have mercy. It's a great blessing. And, and, and this couple is going to put it together. Uh, God is reaching out for a second touch. He has a second touch for you. Because life is not always peaches and cream. Life is not always flowers. Life is up and down. Life sometimes has all the thorns in life that it can give you. But you need that touch. And the touch comes from the Lord. Amen. Oh, it might come through somebody. Somebody may walk up to you and, 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 and fulfill a need that you did not ever know about. That's the way it is with God. I, uh, I did a uh, a seminar in Richardson, Texas, uh, not Richardson, uh, somewhere in Texas, and they put me in a in a hotel, and I guess there was about two thousand of us were there, and uh, the hotel where I was staying was a mile and a half away from the church, and and so they said my session is going to start at nine thirty, at nine o'clock. I went downstairs waiting for somebody to come and pick me up. Nobody was there. And, and I said, oh, my Lord, what do I do? And, and, and then uh, I, I looked for the number. 
to call the church, and I couldn't find the number. So I sat there saying, I'm going to have a problem. I'm not going to be able to get to the church on time. I'm not going to be able to fulfill my obligation. And I sat down, and I'm just sitting there in the lobby and, 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 and contemplating what's going to happen next. And a man walked through. Walked through the lobby, went out, and got in his car. And I saw him drive away. Never seen him before in my life. And then a few minutes later, that man drove back to uh, the driveway of the hotel, walked in, and he says, are you going to that church down there? And I said, yes. He said, you look like you need a ride. <laughs> when I walked out, I was on my way, and you look like you need a ride. There's somebody in here who needs a ride with God. And God is waiting for you to step out and say, yes, I need a ride. I need to get on that chariot so that it will go from earth to glory. And on the way, there's going to be some rough sledding. There's going to be some hills to climb. There's going to be some valleys to go through. But I need a ride. And so the ride is having faith in Jesus. Believing that he is the son of the living God. Repent of all of your past sins. Paul, where are you? Uh, there you are. Uh, what song are you going to sing? Prepare to meet thy God. I want you to stand right there. Stand right there, Paul. Stand right there. Uh, uh, my brother, can you, can you come right here for a minute? You know that song, Prepare to Meet Thy God? I want you to stand right here. I want you to stand right here. I want everybody to stand on their feet. Now, these two people are going to help you on that ride. They're going to help you on that ride. And you don't have to wait for the song. You don't have to wait for the, If you need Jesus in your life, if you need to have a change in your life, if you need God to touch you in one way or another, walk down this aisle. And we will pray for you. Come right now while we sing. Tell us so, why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear you not the invitation? Oh, prepare to meet thy God.